My guest today is Dr. Anthony Vasaturo, Assistant Professor of Mathematics, and we're going to talk about Fermat's Last Theorem. Thank you, Anthony, for joining me today. Thanks for having me, James. Okay, well, to start, there may be many listeners out there wondering what we're talking about. Uh, for those listeners, can you explain what Fermat's Last Theorem is? Right, so it comes from a um, mathematician from the 1600s, uh, Pierre Fermat. And he had a copy of Diophantus' Arithmetica book. And in the margin somewhere in, in his copy, he wrote that he had a truly wonderful proof or a truly marvelous proof, depending on how you interpret it, of a certain beautiful statement. And um, you can explain Fermat's last theorem to a grade schooler. Um, that's what's nice about it. And it says that for any fixed integer n that's at least 3, the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no what we call non-trivial integer solutions. There are no integers x, y, and z you can actually plug into that equation to solve it. And what I mean by non-trivial is if you find such an integer solution, one of the entries has to just be zero. And so roughly speaking, this equation, which we call the Fermat equation, has hardly any integer solutions. And the ones that it does have are sort of uninteresting. At least one of the entries are zero. What was the book he referenced that he made the uh, notation So it's an in? old book of Diophantus called Arithmetica. I mean, he was like uh, Greek. Yeah, uh, way back. We're talking way, back, way, way prior, yeah. And is this, I mean, I remember, you know, you talked about grade school. I remember A squared plus B squared equals C squared, which that's mm -hmm. kind of a variation on this, right? That's the but Fermat it, equation with exponent 2. Right. But it, anything above 2 then doesn't work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what's interesting is if you look at the Fermat equation with exponent 2, something completely different happens. Not You get infinitely many non-trivial solutions, first of all. Secondly, they mean something. By Pythagorean's theorem, those integer solutions constitute sides of a right triangle. So there's geometric meaning, there's infinitely many non-trivial solutions, and you can even parameterize them. Okay, and when you say parameterize, what does that? I mean, not only are there infinitely many, but the set of solutions is well-structured. Like, I can give you formulas for all of the integer solutions to the Fermat equation with exponent 2, but the second you bump that exponent up to 3, it's all destroyed. Very remarkable. So how did it get the name Fermat's Last Theorem? Hmm. So as far as I know, it all begins with the fact that Fermat was an influential mathematician of the 1600s, and he came up with a lot of interesting questions that still profoundly impact myth mathematics a lot. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is when he bothered to write something down or ask something, the mathematical community paid attention. And so everything that he was able to write down in one of his journals or, or in his margins of this book, mathematicians were able to solve over, over the centuries, except this one. <laughs> this one took the longest, and so it was the last one, in quotes. And so it's called Fermat's Last Theorem. Obviously, he's real big in the mathematical community, but are there any other theorems that you know might be commonly known today that uh, he, yes. was, he is credited with? One that comes to mind is Fermat's Little Theorem. It gets used in abstract algebra a lot, and it has to do with modular arithmetic. Admittedly, I'm blanking on any other ones that actually bear his name, but I'm sure there are other results that are due to him that aren't necessarily named after him that I, I just don't know how to attribute them to him because I know thousands of theorems by now. And I don't yeah. know who proved all of them. Yeah. And you mentioned a little bit about this theorem in my prior question, but what is the significance of this particular theorem? Well, this is a really tough question to answer to people who aren't pure mathematicians. It's so I'll answer it kind of three different ways. The first thing is it's significant to the masses, let's, let's say, because it's simple, it's elegant, it's inherently symmetric, there's a nice symmetry to that equation. It's general, it's a very general result, um, and it's also approachable. I can explain the problem to anybody, like I said, to, to a talented grade schooler. And then, I mean, number theorists love two things, right? They love studying prime numbers, and they love solving equations. Well, this is solving a large class of simple, elegant, symmetric equations, so it's going to be inherently interesting. It's hard not to get addicted to a question that just screams like, I'm solvable. <laughs> Please solve me, even when you have a hard time. There's another side to this coin, though. So the ultimate proof of this, due to Wiles and Taylor in 1994, was revolutionary. And it brought together a ton of different ideas across all different fields of mathematics. And we're talking really hard fields of mathematics. Algebraic geometry, one of the hardest mathematical fields by itself. Algebraic number theory, elliptic curves, complex analysis, modular forms, representation theory, algebra, topology, harmonic analysis. You need tools from all of these major fields of mathematics to ultimately solve this. And so that's going to be important, right? When a problem takes all of that power to solve and then also builds all these bridges between all these fields of mathematics, there's importance there, whether or not you realized it. 
I mean, to give you an idea, Wiles and Taylor's proof was over 100 pages in the Annals Journal, which is the top journal in mathematics. That's in the Annals Journal, the, the journal that's the most prestigious, that has the highest level reader base, the reader base with the most background and knowledge. It still took 100 pages to explain the proof to them. If you were to learn all this from the ground up, from first principles, it'd be probably hundreds of thousands of pages of mathematics, to be, to be honest with you. And so I'll just say, like, anytime number theorists can get a handle on how to solve large classes of polynomial equations like this, it's important because you never know whether the techniques used to solve those equations are going to be used to solve other classes of equations in the future. You just never know when pure math is going to get used. And so you combine this with the beauty, the symmetry, the elegance, the simplicity I was just talking about, and the fact that the theorem was last. That's also kind of a big selling point. And, and you just have, I mean, it's a recipe for, for a real treat when it finally gets solved. At some point, this problem was worth over a million dollars, not to mention any speaking engagements and book deals and sponsorships you got as a result of solving it. So one more thing about why the, the theorem is significant, though, is Fermat's last theorem secretly isn't really about the statement itself or even its proof. It's hiding something in it. It turns out that to prove Fermat's last theorem, you have to prove something much more important and deep and interesting. And then Fermat's last theorem just comes out as a special case, kind of as an afterthought. And that theorem is called the modularity theorem of elliptic curves. And I can state it very simply and elegantly, but I, I won't be able to explain it here. But it's a nice catchphrase for everybody to leave with. The theorem says all elliptic curves over the rationals are modular. That is a much deeper and more important statement than Fermat's last theorem, but it turns out it implies Fermat's last theorem essentially immediately. I think it's a lot of small to medium-sized qualities combined that really makes this, this problem special. So for those who may not have a mathematical background, what exactly is a theorem and why is it important uh, in mathematics? Yeah, this is a good question. You have to realize that mathematics is built on two things. Definitions of various basic objects, constructions like sets, for example, um, and then axioms. So axioms are things that we sort of all agree to be true, um, but we can't, not, we can't prove them from first principles. In fact, sometimes we can prove that we can't prove them <laughs> from first principles. It's like we all know that's true, but you can't actually prove it, it turns out. And so, so like a proposition in mathematics is something that you can prove only using the definitions, the axioms, and binary logic, okay? Objectively. You can objectively demonstrate its truth value. And then a theorem would be like a kind of an extra important or foundational or deep or ubiquitous proposition. And when you're talking about a first principle, what is that? So let's lump like definitions and axioms together into one big category that we'll just call first principles. Okay. And, and maybe just binary logic along with that. So looking at Fermat's last theorem, it seems like a, a relatively simple equation. I mean, and like I said, you know, Pythagorean theorem. Right. Um, so why was it so hard to prove? There seems to be kind of a general misconception among the general public and amongst mathematicians that something that's simple to state must somehow be simple to prove. And if you actually sit down and think about it, you realize there's no reason that should be the case, A. And B, you realize that maybe the opposite should be true a lot of the time. If something is simple, that means I don't have to, a lot to go off of if I'm trying to prove it, right? And that might lend considerable difficulty to the, to the eventual solution. Uh, maybe this will be enlightening. Here's a related question to Fermat's last theorem. How do we know whether a polynomial with some number of variables, like the Fermat equation, for example, has an integer solution? That's a much even simpler question than Fermat's last theorem. It's also much more general. It subsumes Fermat's last theorem completely. But the question is much more general than Fermat's last theorem, and so it's much more difficult. I've given you far less to go off of there, and the simplicity lies in the broadness and the generality as well, and the more general something is, the harder it's going to be to prove. So you have that, but I can even push this a step further. This question has been answered in some sense. We have the Matiasevich theorem, which says that um, there is no algorithm that will actually detect for you whether or not in general you can find an integer solution to, to all polynomials. I mean, that's kind of a loose explanation of the theorem, but we have some kind of answer to this. This is Hilbert's 10th problem. That insight, though, gives us extra, uh, an extra look into why Fermat's last theorem specifically might be hard. The Matiasevich theorem says we cannot hope for a general theory of polynomials 
to save us when we're trying to solve for Mott's last theorem. There is no generic algorithmic theory of polynomials that's going to somehow appear out of the clouds, solve polynomials in general, and then we can apply it specifically to Fermat's equation. That's not going to happen. The theorem guarantees you that that's not going to happen. Well, that's added difficulty, right? If I know there's no algorithm coming to save me, I have to do something else to solve the equation. And so now you're left in a situation where you presumably have to rely on the special inherent properties that only the Fermat equation has to actually solve it because there's no general theory coming to save you. And it's like, well, what are these properties? Who knows? And you might say, well, no. I can make the problem even simpler. I, I can get around your, your special properties. I can just ask the question, is there an integer solution to polynomials in three variables with integer coefficients of fixed degree? That would still be more general than Fermat's last equation, and it would subsume it. It's like, fine, you can ask that. The problem is that, that questions like that are still really hard to solve. They're too generic. They might be really simple, but they're too generic. The best result we have along uh, these lines is probably Faulting's theorem which says that algebraic curves kind of cut out, if you like, by these polynomials. They are guaranteed to only have finitely many solutions that have rational coordinates. And a rational number, for those listening, is just like a fraction. Okay. So that's not, I mean, it doesn't specify how many. It just says there can only be finitely many. It doesn't tell you how to find them. It doesn't tell you how many there are. It doesn't tell you if there are none. I mean, no solutions is finitely many still, right? And so it, it just doesn't cut it. Um, we don't have the tools there's the real short answer here like in a nutshell polynomial equations are hard to solve they always have been and they're they're, they're always going to be when F fermat made his notation back in the, the 1600s did mathematicians know that um that it was going to be hard or next to impossible to solve it or has that no kind of theory developed <laughs> since then well i can tell you for sure that they did not know it was going to even be a, a fraction as hard as it ended up being. Most of the tools that were used to solve it weren't even, not only were they not developed, we, they weren't even on our radar. We still did know back then that polynomials were hard to solve, just like we knew prime numbers were hard to get a handle on and it's hard to factor integers, things like that. I mean, the basic questions were still there. I think people thought it would be solved relatively quickly, especially because Fermat wrote in that margin, he claimed he had already proven it. He just couldn't fit the proof in the margin, he said. And so everybody was like, I mean, I think people thought it'd probably be solved in under 50 years is my guess. Definitely under a century, but, you know, it took more than 350 years. <laughs> so. so why did so many mathematicians try to prove it? A lot of that has sort of been answered in previous questions, but it boils down to like any time number theorists can get a handle on how to solve a large class of polynomial equations or something like that. There's a chance that they'll develop some kind of theory that might enhance our abilities to solve larger classes of equations as a whole. And that's going to give you prestige, right? And then you've got the beauty, the symmetry, the elegance, the simplicity we already talked about, the fact that the theorem was last, the fact that it taunted essentially the whole mathematical community for over 300 years. And you've, you've just got a recipe for something that's going to admit prestige. I mean, I think a lot of the time people do things for prestige, and I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. But when there's a million dollars on the line and essentially eternal legacy on the line, I mean, you're going to try to solve this equation. I mean, the, the problem is very interesting, too. It's so simple. Yeah, I mean, you're the guy who proved for Mott's theorem if you end up doing it, and Andrew Wiles is, is that guy. So, and Who was offering a million dollars for the uh, Oh, proof? I don't remember. It was either the, the Millennium Prize thing, so the Clay Institute, or if it was some other fund. Like right now, like nowadays, the Millennium Prize, is a, there's a list of problems that are each worth about a million dollars, and they all it's all funded by one place called the, the Clay Institute or the Millennium Prize, okay? But there are other people who have offered large sums of money for problems in the past, and there are even problems today that are worth at least that much that are not covered by this this prize. And so I'm not exactly sure. Not going into a 100-page description, obviously, but how was it proven? Oh, no, we're not going to go there. Um, this question by itself deserves anywhere from a three-hour podcast to a three-year-long podcast, but uh, I'll summarize. So first of all, come to colloquium tomorrow. I'll be putting the colloquium up probably on my YouTube channel anyway, but uh, okay. I'll be discussing a little bit of more in depth about the history of Fermat's last theorem, and I'll be proving exponent four. And then in the next colloquium, which is about a month from today, I will prove exponent three in another colloquium. And that's important because the first thing you have to do, you have to prove the theorem for exponents three and four, it turns out. And so that was done, you know, centuries ago. Fermat did exponent four and Euler did exponent three. Although exponent three is much harder than exponent four. Once you've done that, you have to realize that the real secret behind the general theorem isn't the theorem at all, like I already sort of touched on a little while ago. So here's the proof strategy. 
Um, the first thing you notice is I don't have to prove it for all exponents. I only have to prove it for prime exponents. And the reason for that is if I have a solution to the Fermat equation with exponent n, and n is a composite number, that automatically gives me a solution to the Fermat equation for any prime exponent dividing that, that, okay. that composite number. Okay, so that throws out most integers right there. I just have to solve Fermat equations for prime exponents. Perfect. In fact, for odd prime exponents. So you're, you pick a prime p, and you're trying to show x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p doesn't have any non-trivial integer solutions. And so p is a prime that's at least 5. So what you do is you assume there is a, such a solution, and you try to produce a logical contradiction to that existence of that solution. So we call this a proof by contradiction in mathematics. Okay, so you've got some solution, right? Let's call it A, B, C. Okay. What you do is you look at this elliptic curve, y squared equals x times x minus a to the p power times x plus b to the p power. This, this turns out to be something called an elliptic curve. Okay, and this elliptic curve has some strange properties that it turns out elliptic curves can't have. Um, there's something called the p torsion field attached to it, and you notice that this field has very little what we call ramification, which suggests that the elliptic curve is arithmetically kind of simple. It's not a very complex object. In fact, the ramification is so small the elliptic curve should be somehow exceedingly simple. So you look at that, then you look at two other things on the curve, the discriminant of the curve and the conductor, and you notice some issues. The thing that you notice is that the discriminant is huge. It's like 2 to the negative 8th times a pth power, times a quantity that's raised to the p power, where p is this prime you're working with. Well, that could be huge. If p is big, that could be an enormous discriminant. But then you look at the conductor, which is this other number, attached to the elliptic curve, and that's comparatively small, and that's very unusual because you've got this ramification of the p-torsion field suggesting a, a low complexity curve. You've got a discriminant suggesting an incredibly complex curve. The bigger the discriminant, generally, the more complicated the curve. And then you have a small conductor relative to the discriminant, which suggests a low complexity curve. And it's like, what the heck is going on here? Now, none of this is formal. Mm -hmm. This is all just sort of evidence that something's gone wrong. But you can begin to formalize this. The first thing you notice is there's something called the Spiro conjecture, which is equivalent to another million-dollar problem called the ABC conjecture. And we don't know that the ABC conjecture is true, but we have strong empirical evidence suggesting that is everybody believes the ABC conjecture is true. Well, guess what? Spiro's conjecture, which is equivalent to the ABC conjecture, has a counterexample if you allow this elliptic curve to exist. Spiro's conjecture relates the discriminant and the conductor of an elliptic curve and says they have to satisfy a certain inequality. And this elliptic curve here, called the Fry curve, the discriminant and the conductor break that. They show that Spiro's conjecture is not true. So again, though, that's not enough because Spiro's conjecture is just a conjecture. You can't use it like a theorem. You don't know it's true, even though we all believe it is. So how do you actually get there? Um, the key is another theorem about elliptic curves, which is now called the modularity theorem because it was... The semi-stable case was proven by Wiles. That's essentially what he did to prove Fermat's last theorem. And the general theorem was proven in, I think, 2001 by uh, Bruhl, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. It's a very, very hard theorem. It used to be known as the taniyama shimura conjecture before Wiles you know, proved it to, to prove Fermat's last theorem. And what it says is that every elliptic curve over Q is modular. So we touched on this earlier in the podcast. And so Wiles and his student Richard Taylor's contribution to the proof of Fermat's last theorem was they proved the taniyama shimura vey conjecture, um, in the case uh, that the elliptic curve you're working with was what's called semi-stable. Okay. Now, it's very easy to see that this Fry curve we built is semi-stable. It's not hard to, to prove that at all. And so if you can prove, if you believe taniyama, taniyama shimura vey, it's then this elliptic curve it must be modular. Well, you do a bunch of work, and you realize that what this means is that associated to this elliptic curve, there must be something called a modular form, and modular forms have a weight and a level. And you calculate the weight and the level for this particular modular form that you get, and you see that it ends up being weight 2 and level 2. And wouldn't you know it, there aren't any modular forms of weight 2 and level 2. There's your logical contradiction. Okay. Okay. So it's very hard to show all of this. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. No, you can't do it in 25 words or no, less. No, 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 no. So, so how and why did you become interested in Fermat's last theorem? Well, this is a bit of an interesting story. I, I knew when I took a job at a place like Trine that it was teaching focused. But I, I was worried sort of professionally. There's not much time or incentive for, for research 
at a job like this. But I was sort of scared that I would lose my ability to do like postgraduate level mathematics if I didn't flex my, my muscles every now and then. And I can tell you right now that if I had quit my studies, I mean, this is my fourth year at Trine, by now I would know and be able to do much less mathematics. And that worries me. Like I spent a lot of time in, in graduate school gaining all these capabilities. I want to keep them. Like I didn't want to waste my PhD, I guess, in a sense. Um, so I, I had a little bit of a professional <laughs> crisis about three years ago. And I decided, no, it's time to jump back on the horse. We got to keep studying. We got to keep learning. I mean, I even know, I think I even owe that to my students, honestly. And so I made an incredibly impulsive decision one day. I woke up in the morning and during the previous day and in all previous days, I had thought nothing about this. I woke up one morning and I said to myself, you know what? I'm either going to resume taking courses and reading textbooks or I'm going to pick some huge landmark theorem of mathematics that almost nobody understands and I'm going to learn it. And I decided to do the latter because I figured it would involve the former. And so I was like, all right, well, what can I do? I mean, I knew of, of a handful of options. And I was like, you know what? Let's do Fermat's last theorem. I don't know personally anybody that knows the proof very well. I can be that guy. I can fill that need. And maybe I can even do something with it. Maybe I can, like, expose it to the world in, in some way in the future. And so it was literally an incredibly impulsive morning decision while I'm laying in bed. I'm just going to learn this thing. Uh, so, and I started immediately that day. I put in several hours that day, and I've put in several hours a day, almost seven days a week since, uh, with very little time off. And it's interesting because my PhD is in complex analysis, operator theory. And so the stuff that I was trained in, you need very little of for Fermat's last theorem. And the stuff that you do need for Fermat's last theorem, I knew almost none of. I had very little high-level training in it. So I had to learn, you know, algebraic geometry, algebraic number theory, commutative algebra, and a bunch of stuff from essentially the ground up. And that was fun. I mean, I'm glad that I, like I said, I thought this strategy would involve me learning a lot more course material and reading a lot of textbooks. So I'm glad I chose this instead of just willy-nilly taking classes. But that's the story. I mean, it's, it's not like some gradual epiphany or anything. I woke up one day and I was like, I got to do something. I have to, I have to keep building. What benefits in general have come out of proving this particular theorem? Well, I can tell you that the theory of Diophantine equations, which is just essentially polynomial equations that have integer coefficients, like the Fermat equation, that whole theory and the related field of Diophantine geometry will never be the same. Um, the techniques that were invented and discovered uh, while Wiles and Taylor were proving the, the taniyama shimura vey conjecture, uh, they have impacted number theory irreversibly. People still use those techniques to solve other classes of equations today. At the time, like, as I said, Wiles and, and Taylor's proof of semi-stable modularity in 1994, which was their, their achievement, that was their major contribution to Fermat's last theorem. And the full modularity theorem for all elliptic curves, not just the semi-stable ones, that was proven later in 2001. But what we know now is, that we didn't know back then, the modularity theorem is actually a very teeny tiny sliver special case of something called the Langlands program. Um, and I'll just say like the Langlands program for what we call n equals one is class field theory, which is a crown jewel of number theory. Class field theory has been known for some time now. If you move up to Langlands program for what we call n equals two, you see that the modularity theorem is a special case of n equals two Langlands program. And so modularity and all these deep questions about Fermat's last theorem sit inside this much, much larger, very much more difficult framework now, which we didn't realize back then. So I'll say a little bit about Langlands. Local Langlands, we call it, since, since then has been proven for all n, in all cases, we say. And I think that was done in 2000, 2001, something like that. Now, global Langlands, we call it, is still unsolved to this day for general n, we call it. But like I said, modularity is a special case of global Langlands for n equals 2. And get, wouldn't you know, we haven't really progressed very much in global Langlands past what we already know. Modul the modularity theorem is about as far as global Langlands has gotten, which suggests that it's much deeper than we even knew it was back in the 90s and early 2000s. We knew it was deep, but we didn't know that 20 years later it would be part of a much broader framework, and we would never have guessed that we wouldn't have been able to push past it very much within that framework. So that suggests even greater depth than we realized. It's a hard theorem. And you'll hear like the general public who know about Langlands, you, you often hear it called a theory of everything. It's not really accurate, but there's a truth to it. It's essentially an extensive, mind-blowing sort of abstract web of theorems and bridges. That's what mm -hmm. the Langlands program is. And these bridges connect all kinds of different fields of mathematics together in very non-trivial, deep, unexpected ways. And, um, 
So there, there is a sense in which it is a theory of everything. If the Langlands program were to be fully solved, again, mathematics would be irreversibly, uh, it would be irreversibly changed in ways that it's never been irreversibly changed before. It might be the single greatest mathematical accomplishment of humanity ever, and uh, but we're not close. <laughs> okay, Lang Langlands is, is tough. It sounds yeah. kind of like going back to where Fermat was in the 1600s. With, with a lot more modern developments behind you and, and supporting you, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it doesn't take too long after like a deep result happens for mathematicians to try to place it within some, some larger picture. Um, mathematicians are very good at abstraction and generalization. And so, I mean, once Langlands gets solved, if that happens, I mean, I think most people think we're a ways off from that. But once that does, maybe that's part of some larger framework. Who knows? I mean, it could go on forever. <laughs> Is it kind of a case of the more you know, the more you know that you don't know? It's very much that. It's, it's even maybe worse than that. <laughs> the more you know, the more you realize you don't know anything. And the more you realize, it's kind of like how, there's, a, there's an analogy I like to use. If you're on an island, and the island itself like represents your wisdom and knowledge in totality, and the ocean represents the things you don't know, okay, fine, maybe the water recedes, right? You grow in knowledge and wisdom, and the island gets bigger. But that doesn't change. That just exposes you to more of the ocean, right? <laughs> that just shows you how much more you don't know. And you can't even, you don't even know how far the ocean goes. It goes farther than you can even see, right? So, and that doesn't change as the island grows. <laughs> so, why is working through these types of uh, mathematical proofs so important? All right. So, this sort of depends on who you are. The more deep mathematics that humanity develops and discovers, the better off we all are. Are there real world applications to a lot of this stuff? Maybe not. Maybe not right now. Maybe not ever. But the mathematicians involved certainly don't care if there are. Um, pure mathematicians generally don't care if, if their work gets applied. They do it for the beauty. But there are people out there who also realize, even among the pure mathematicians, that it might be the case that 100 years from now, the techniques behind Fermat's last theorem are used in medicine or in the military or something like that. I mean, Abstract algebraic geometry, for example, is probably a field that most people didn't think would be applied um, to, to the general public anytime soon, but it is. People are using algebraic geometry all over the place now. Well, who's to say that the same isn't true about the techniques in, in Fermat's last theorem? Who knows? But we do it for the beauty. And we also realize, like, pure mathematicians like structure. What you're doing when you're uncovering these deep mathematical truths is you are pulling out, you're digging up some of the deep abstract structure of the reality we live in. And whether or not you're equipped as a human to actually handle and apply that is a different story. But you discovered a piece of the structure of reality, or at least a reality that lives alongside the reality we live in, which is the world of mathematics. And you could even argue that that world governs the world we live in. And so it's important to discover structure for beauty's sake, and because you you never know what's going to happen in the future. This These discoveries live longer than you'll ever live, and you never know what's going to happen. So are there... Other theorems out there like Fermat's that are that same sort of, um, I don't know, the Mount Everest of theorems or any that are 300 years old or more that are, people are still trying to prove? Well, the th I'll give you some theorems, but almost none of them are 300 years old. I'll give you a handful, and one of them is very old. So I'll give you some of the pinnacle theorems that are still out there. We have the ABC conjecture, which I talked about recently. Um, that was posed in the 1980s, though. And that's equivalent to Spiro's conjecture on elliptic curves that I talked about. Elliptic curves, if you, can't, if you couldn't tell from this podcast by now, are very rich, deep, important, robust, beautiful objects that contain a lot of power. I'm teaching a class on them right now, actually. Um, so we have that. We have the ABC conjecture. There's another million-dollar problem that we're waiting on called the BSD conjecture, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. It's another problem on elliptic curves. That was posed in the 1960s. That's about the rank of elliptic curves, and the, the rank attached to an elliptic curve is a very mysterious number. We know very little about it. The resolution to the BSD conjecture would resolve another basic geometry problem called the congruent number problem, and I have a nine-part series of talks on the congruent number problem on my YouTube if anybody's interested in learning the, the nuts and bolts behind that. But that's a basic geometry problem about triangles that we still can't solve because we need the BSD conjecture to be true randomly. Okay, then there's, I mean, what does everybody know, right? Everybody knows the Riemann hypothesis. That's still out there. That's probably the single most uh, kind of deep and famous unsolved problem. We expect that 
we expect that we don't even have the tools to solve it right now. Now, that was posed back in 1859. And its generalizations are essentially about the zeros of what we call the Riemann zeta function. And if, if we were to resolve the Riemann hypothesis, we would know a lot more about the structure and the distribution of the prime numbers. And like I said, number theorists like two things, learning more about prime numbers and solving equations. And so if Riemann hypothesis would, would give us kind of insight into both of those things. And you might argue, like I said, this is the single most important open problem right now. Um, there's also the twin prime conjecture, which a lot of people have heard of. Um, so look at all the prime numbers, right? But then notice that some of the prime numbers are like two apart, like five and seven, for example. Okay. The twin prime conjecture purports that there are infinitely many pairs of primes like that, mm. that are only distance two apart. And um, we've made progress on this even in the last decade, but it's still very hard. And again, I think this is one where people expect that we don't quite, quite even have the tools to solve it yet. Um, we need more insights. There's also gold box conjecture, which is about sums of powers of numbers. There's the Hodge conjecture. That's another million dollar problem that's on that millennium prize list. And then that's not even to get into like the computer science and applied math problems like like P versus NP and Yang Mills and stuff like that. And none of that is to get into the thousands of interesting smaller open problems that there are in all fields of mathematics. And that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be tens of thousands of, of interesting open problems. But I gave you the biggest highlights there. And you, I know you mentioned earlier is it Langley. Was it? Oh uh, yeah, let's also not forget the Langlands program. I'm Langlands, sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's a that's a quite a big one. Sorry, sorry to not bring that one up. But the Langlands program, it's tough to call that like a problem that's unsolved because it's such a big web of mm -hmm. potential theorems and results that I doubt it will be the case that any one person just cracks global Langlands as a whole. I mean, maybe, but cause there's some smart people out there. You've mentioned your YouTube channel a couple of times, and I was uh, going to bring that up. And I know uh, part of your YouTube channel covers Fermat's Last Theorem. Why did you decide to produce a video series? Right. So I started out, I made a nine-part series of talks on the congruent number problem, which has to do with the BSD conjecture. And I just, I was learning the BSD conjecture and congruent number problem en route to learning Fermat's Last Theorem. I figured it'd be a good so-called warm-up, even though it's quite difficult by itself. Um, then I decided to start, I'm three years into this Fermat's last theorem journey. I intend on it taking between six and ten years uh, to get to the point where I'm actually comfortable with all the details of everything. But I was like, you know what, after three years I know enough to start putting stuff up on YouTube. I don't think there was anywhere out there that exposed the proof in video format as well and in as much detail as I'm trying to do. A lot of the stuff that you can find are like talks and seminars at high level math conferences that I think most people, even students of mathematics would have a hard time understanding or they're low quality or the audio is bad or they're incomplete or something like that. And so I was like, you know what, this is my way of giving back. I don't think you should just consume. I think you should give back. Right. And so I can consume for Mott's last theorem all day. But if I'm not willing to give back, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing here. But there are a couple other things going on there. I mean, I always, I always wanted to learn the basic ropes of YouTube because I think it's good for people to be able to, to have confidence in putting themselves out there to the general public. I think everybody should learn these basic skills if they can. But then here's the last reason. The last reason is the best way to learn something is to teach it. And the best way to teach something, to put the most pressure on you to learn it the best, is to teach it to the public. And so I was like, if I really want to learn Vermont's last theorem well, I've got to get out there and start going on podcasts and start putting videos up on YouTube and forcing myself to teach it correctly to other people. And I have to say, I mean, I'm like I'm like 70 videos into Vermont's Last Theorem now because I try to just make them a couple minutes each. And I've learned a lot, <laughs> like way more than I thought I would learn. Stuff I thought I already knew. It's like, no, when you go to put it in video format like that, you realize you don't quite know it as well as you thought. And once you make that video, it's like a whole new level unlocked or something. So I'm putting videos up four days a week right now. Um, Monday to Thursday, so. Okay. And where um, is your, what's the address for your YouTube oh, channel? It's called Dr. V. And so I'm hoping when you type that in, there's no competition for those keywords and I just come up immediately. But yeah, that, that's the name of the channel. Okay. And you said too, do you, do you have some other topics on there besides Fermat? Right now, I just have the nine-part series on congruent number problem. Okay. And then I have Fermat's last theorem. But my eventual goal is to essentially teach every class with examples, exercises, solution, stuff like that, starting at like, let's say Calc 1, all the way up. I mean, this is a grand vision here. I'd like to go all the way up to like post-doctorate level mathematics and teach every class 
from calculus one all the way up. I mean, this might take decades, but all right, so be it. Right? It's unlimited content, right? Yep. And I think there's kind of a need for this. I think mathematics on YouTube kind of stops at a certain point, and I don't, I don't think it should stop. I think all of it should be made available to the general public. Whether or not they understand it or like it, that's a different thing. But So where, where are some other places people can learn more about Fermat's last theorem? All right, I comprised a nice little list for you guys here. Okay, so first of all, my colloquiums, I'll just plug those again. Um, my YouTube channel is a great place to come. So some actual books. Uh, there's a book called Fermat's Last Theorem for Amateurs, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this author's name, Ribbonboim. I'm not sure, but that's a good place to start, especially if you don't have a lot of mathematical training. There's also Edward's book, Fermat's Last Theorem, A Genetic Introduction to Algebraic Number Theory. So it kind of shows you how the field of algebraic number theory came about as a result of questions like Fermat's last theorem. We knew there were tools we didn't have developed. And so a lot of algebraic number theory was just developed because of this one equation. <laughs> but believe it or not, even though algebraic number theory is far more ubiquitous than Fermat's last theorem, Fermat's last theorem is to blame for a lot of its development. There's a Cox introduction to Fermat's last theorem. There's Boston's art. I think it's an article. Um, a tailor-made plug for Wiles Proof, which is kind of a play on words because it was Wiles and Taylor. Taylor. Yeah. There's Saito's two books on Fermat's Last Theorem, S-A-I-T-O. Um, I don't remember the names of those. One of them is like the preliminary tools needed, and the other one is focuses on the proof itself. Stanford University has a modularity theorem seminar website, and you can go watch some videos and read some, some notes about the modularity theorem itself there. There's the Diamond Darman Taylor notes called, I think they're just called Fermat's Last Theorem, and they're excellent. I still use them. I use them to prepare this podcast even. Then there's the big one. There is the Cornell Silverman Stevens book called Modular Forms in Fermat's Last Theorem, and it's essentially a six, 700 page exposition of the tools needed to prove Fermat's Last Theorem and then the proof itself. Now, it does skip a lot. I mean, you can't do it all in six, 700 pages, but it's hard to find a more, a more comprehensive resource than that. Um, there's the Coates Yao book, Elliptic Curves, Modular Forms in Fermat's Last Theorem. Yao is Y A U. And there's the Vander Porten, I think that's how you say it. He has a, it's either a book or like a journal. I can't remember because I have it as a PDF, but it's called Notes on Fermat's Last Theorem. And then if you want to be really ambitious, <laughs> there's Wiles and Taylor's papers themselves from the, the Annals Journal. And those are called, uh, Wiles' paper is Modular Forms in Fermat's Last Theorem. And then you have Wiles and Taylor, Ring Theoretic Properties of Certain Heca Algebras. And I think those are the best sources. Um, I'm probably missing a lot there. I did quite a lot of research, and I think that should be pretty comprehensive. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like uh, plenty, plenty to read for anyone yeah. who's interested in Oh, yeah. In oh, it, yeah. So. Just, just in the, that list, you could, you could spend your whole life probably. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Anthony Vassaturo for joining me today for Faculty Focus. Please be sure to check back for new episodes as Trine faculty members talk about their research interests and the issues of the day. All right. Thanks, James.